What is up, Fitchtown? All right, we're in Isaiah 55. We're on part three. Uh, part one was verses one, one, two, and three. And we talked about coming to the Lord, abiding in Christ. Um, verse four was about how Christ is a witness to the people, a leader, a commander. Now we're in verse five. It says, Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. So the you that he's talking about here is Jesus. Okay? The Lord your God, the Holy One, the Father, has glorified the Son. Okay? Um, but the beginning part of this verse is a little bit confusing. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you. What this is prophesying is the fact that there will be once Christ is glorified on the cross, there is no no distinction between Jews and Gentiles. And he came to save everybody. It's just like... Um, he came to save everyone. So this promise, though, it was... So, so Isaiah is prophesying this, and the Jews didn't pick up on this. One of the reasons they didn't pick up on this is because if you look back into Genesis, back into Genesis with when the Lord was talking to Abraham, so in Genesis... Uh, Chapter 15, verse 5 um, says, and this is uh, the Lord speaking with Abraham. And he brought him outside and said, so that he is God and the him is Abraham. Look towards heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. So this was a promise made to Abraham, part of the Abrahamic covenant, um, and, and the various promises that he made to Abraham. Uh, that he would make him a great nation as his descendants would be more numerous than the, than the stars okay so when the Jews looked at that they said they, they they thought of the physical nation of Israel the the actual country the nation the people of Israel right and Abraham's descendants being those of of the lineage of the bloodline um, with Abraham but when you look to Galatians Paul goes on to explain it and the best way to interpret scripture is with scripture so in Galatians um, chapter 3 verses 10 through 14 and then we're going to skip down to 15 to 29 this is the righteous shall live by faith for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse for it is written cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law for the righteous shall live by faith but the law is not a faith rather the one who does them shall live by them Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who who hanged on a tree. So it's referring to him um, being uh, crucified on the cross. So, okay, verse 14. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Okay? We receive, so it, make sure you caught that. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So then you skip down to Galatians uh, verses 25 and 29. This thing is impossible. Um, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. And the guardian is the law. It's referring to the law. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put Christ on. Therefore, neither Jew, Jew, therefore, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. If you go over to Romans 10, uh, 11 through 13, Paul, speaking of the Romans, says, For Scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So if you're wondering, what do I got to do to be saved, fish? What do I got to do? You got to call on the name of the Lord. It means you put your faith, hope, and trust in Jesus Christ. You say, this isn't something I can do. I need you to do for me what I can't do for myself. And he did that on the cross, which is what Isaiah is speaking to in chapter 55, verse 5. So 
It says, Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you. So this is referring to the other nations other than Israel. And you see here, though, that for the Israelites, that wouldn't make sense. They're like, well, how, how, is, how is the Savior going to save other people? Like, he's coming for us. He's our king. And what Isaiah is saying, no, he's king of everybody. And he, he came to redeem the world. Um, and that's what Paul explains to us in Galatians and Romans. Um, now, if you go to the second part of verse 5, because it starts with because. So, so why is this happening? How is this happening? Because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. The you being Christ. Christ has been glorified. If um, There's a really great passage in Exodus 34, 5 and 6. It says, the Lord, oh, so this is just for some quick context. This is Moses had um, just broken the Ten Commandments, not broken all the laws, literally broke the tablets. He got ticked off because he, he went up on the mountain for 40 days to get the Ten Commandments and, and all the law, all the 613 laws, and or whatever the number is. And then he, um, I think that's it. When he came down, the Israelites were already like, ah, oh, forget Moses, forget God. They built a golden calf and were, worship, were worshiping a made-up God idol that they made. Um, and then Moses got so ticked off, he dropped the, slammed down the, uh, the tablets, broke the Ten Commandments. So God is like, make two more tablets, I'll rewrite them. That's basically what's happening in, um, <laughs> in Exodus 34. So Moses is getting a redo on this, although he's going to be punished for what he did, but he's getting a redo on it. The Lord's going to rewrite the tablets. So Moses is making the tablets, and it says in, in Exodus 34, 5 and 6, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord. A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving inequity and transgression and sin, but who by no means will clear the guilty, visiting the inequity of the fathers on their children and children's children to the third and fourth generation. So what you see here is the, is the character and nature of who God is. He's, he's all love and he's all righteousness and he and he's all justice so so he he forgives sin but all sin is simultaneously punished sin cannot go unpunished it must be punished and and so you, you see that that character this is the perfect glory the perfect holiness of of god's character that that he's gracious he's slow to anger he's merciful he's steadfast in his love he's faithful he's he's steadfast in love for thousands forgiving the inequities and transgressions and sin but at the same time by no means will he clear the guilty visiting the inequity of the fathers on the children and children's children to the third and fourth generation and you have what you have here almost seems like an impossible passage like well how the heck is how how can that happen also i wrote five i said five and six i meant exodus 34 six and seven my bad um, so you see this character and nature of God, but the way this happens is on the cross, right? That's how this happens. So Isaiah, in Isaiah 52, a few passages prior to Isaiah 55, he prophesies of this as well, both of Jesus' death on the cross and of his being glorified. So he says, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up. He shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human resemblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouth because of him for that which has not been told told them they see and that which they have not heard they understand. So a lot going on here in this passage in Isaiah but he's prophesying to the, the Messiah, to Jesus Christ being um, both uh, physically lifted up on the cross he's gonna be lifted up high lifted on the cross and spiritually he's he's lifted up he's exalted because he's 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 glorified at the cross cross uh, christ's glory is found at the cross right because it's the perfect atoning sacrifice he took our punishment and we receive eternal life but sin was also sin and death were defeated at the cross so the first part there he's lifted up the second part um, it, it discusses uh, his condition on the cross. And in the third part, it prophesies towards what he's talking about in Isaiah 55 at the beginning, that he, uh, he says, so shall 
he sprinkle on many nations, right? And if you think about the sprinkling of blood on nations, whenever you hear the term sprinkle, immediately think of Leviticus, okay? So in Leviticus 16, 14, and 15, um, this, is, uh, this is God giving um, commands on how to uh, offer atoning sacrifices um, for the sins of the Israelites. And so it says, and shall, and this is, and this and he's referring to the Ark of the Covenant, okay, which is, was kept in the Holy of Holies inside of the temple, um, uh, the, the tent of meeting where God rested his presence on them, on the Israelites. So anyways, inside of this, verse 14, and he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat, which interesting mercy seat also translated as propitiation. And Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. On the front of the mercy seat and on the east side and on the front of the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times then he shall kill the goat of, of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat thus he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanliness of the people of israel because of their transgressions all their sin sins and so he shall do for the tent of meetings, which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleanliness. So this is how they were to uh, atone for sin. They, they had to follow these procedures. But you see the sprinkling of blood on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant for the, for the forgiveness of sins. And there's specific animals and they had to be perfect spotless animals and different things like that that they would bring forward. And they, they did this every year for the atonement to stay in some sort of right standing with with God um, as it relates you know they had to do this that this was required by the law okay um, to atone for their sin and so you see in Isaiah 52 where he says so so he shall sprinkle many nations so the sprinkling of the blood on the mercy seat was just for the Israelites but now Isaiah is saying he's going to sprinkle for many nations right so again going back to there's neither Jew nor Greek the 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 the, the free gift of eternal life is offered to all people right every nation across the world i mean you could be listening to me anywhere in the world and that free gift is offered to you for all who would call on the name of the lord jesus himself also testifies to him being glorified which is the last part of verse five where he says because talking about the because of of, of um, that there's no jew jew or greek that all nations because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. So in John 17, 1 through 5, you see the high priestly prayer. When Jesus had, had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him all authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they, may, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And so if you go back to that passage in Exodus 34, 5, and 6, where he talked about the glory of God and his character and nature, and you think about Jesus Christ on the cross, right, and the forgiveness of our sins, okay, and, and him hanging, hanging on the cross, bloody, beaten, pierced for our transgressions, uh, breathe, about to breathe his last breath, dying out for us. Um, the Lord, the Lord, a God of merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping stead, steadfast love for thousands, forgiving inequity and transgression and sin, right? That's what took place on the cross. Our sins were forgiven through the sacrificial atonement of, of through the atonement of Jesus Christ on the cross, right? He atoned for our sins for us. But he took the punishment, which is the second part of verse seven. But who will by no means clear the guilty? So make no mistake, all all the sin that you've ever committed, all the sin that I've ever committed was punished or will be punished, one way or the other. It will be punished, right? So either, either Jesus Christ took the punishment for me on the cross, for who by no means will clear the guilty, 
visiting the inequity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So either Jesus took the punishment for me, or I say, no, nah, I got this. I'll take the punishment later, right? Well, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go spend eternity with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And um, my prayer for all of you is that is that you would just put your hope and faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that he, he can accomplish amazing things. And, and it says, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And, um, and that, that's my hope for you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this uh, look at Isaiah 55. Um, 